message is designed to encourage each and every believer to hold on to his faith. Hold on to your faith. And, uh, and, and, you, and, and we really got to get this and, and believe God. There are so many things that are going on. Things that we understand, things that we don't. We just lost a Supreme Court Justice, who was a stalwart opponent of uh, same-sex marriage, an opponent, a, an opponent, a warrior against abortion. And while there was respect in some of those whose beliefs was different from ours on those issues, to possibly pass away and retire, that one died, leaving an opening on the court for possibly um, a replacement that would um, be liberal and not good. Thank God for your mama. So good to see my mother. Amen. <laughs> which inspires us to, to hold on Amen. to our faith. The Republicans last night had a slugfest on one end. On the other end, you got Sanders and Clinton. They're having it out. There's a lot in the balance. Yes. America is closer today to being a failed country than she's ever been. I'm going to teach you one Sunday. I don't have time today. I want to teach you of a document that was written in 1965 that says 10 things that need to be done to destroy Christianity in America. When I read those 10 things that were written in 65. You hear all 10 of those things as planks in political parties today. Don't, if you think for a minute that things are going on as they always have, you are like the people that Peter spoke of who said from the beginning of time, men have said that the Lord is coming. And the, Peter called those men willingly ignorant. Things are changing. As never before, it is important that we believe God. Believe the doctrine. Believe him for healing. Believe him. Because we're going to need to. I want to encourage you to hold on to your faith despite the fact that in life there are interruptions. Interruptions and setbacks. There are times that in life we seem to take two steps back for every step that we take moving forward. Forward. There's a certain, there are times when there's a certain, certain touch and go, touch and go-ness, if you will, in life, on our journey, as we deal with things. Have you ever gone through where when it seems like this is finally working out, then that happens. Or you make gains over here. Only to lose over there. Sometimes your best laid plans 
everything is running smoothly and then something happens that you didn't see coming to interrupt those plans. One phone call from the doctor can change all of your plans. Am I right about that? Amen. One call to the office at work. One announcement layoff can change all of your plans. You just bought the car. Just signed the contract for the new house. And the company meeting, and you went to it, and they announced that they're laying off that entire division. It happens like that. The Bible says that Time and chance happens to all. The fastest man doesn't always win the race. The strongest man doesn't always come out on top. Isn't that what Ecclesiastes says? Life. Amen. But someone said this about the setbacks in life. says, every setback is a setup. For an even greater comeback. Les Brown said anytime you suffer a setback or disappointment. Put your head down and plow ahead. C.S. Lewis had an interesting observation concerning life's interruptions. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said... The great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions of one's own or real life. The truth is, of course, that what we call, what one calls the interruptions is precisely one's real life. The life God is sending you day by day. Isn't that an interesting perspective? LeBar wrote this. She said, uh, she said, if you had slept in the same house or field with Jesus, awakened with him, eaten with him, and helped him, what would you have observed? said, one thing we always think of is that Jesus gave himself almost entirely to what we would consider interruptions. Most of the teachings, healings, and wonders we see in his life were responses, seemingly unplanned. He trusted that what the Father allowed to cross his path was exactly that from the Father. So maybe we might need to see life's surprises and life's interruptions differently. Perhaps instead of it being an interruption, it's just a part of your journey. Even though we didn't see it coming, things happen. Yes, we would all like to go from point A to point B without any glitches all the time. We would all like to land at gate A, A6, concourse A. And that connecting flight have about 45 minutes and the flight is at gate A7. Praise the Lord. Just right across the way and just get off one plane and go right to the next. But if you know anything about Atlanta Hartsfield, sometimes in that 45 minutes you land at gate A, you got to get to T. Get to get, and, and you're way at the bottom of A. You have to walk way up to catch the tram. Go down those escalators. There's, there's always somebody Walking slow. There's always a crowd standing in the in the middle in the in the in the hall in the aisle. And you're trying to get there, and uh, 
uh, many times we miss the flight. And every now and again, it lands and you get off the plane and there's your connector. Our text today deals with a story that is found in all three synoptics. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tells a story. Uh, a story filled with interruptions. And a story filled with challenges. According to Matthew's account, and you won't be able to keep up with me, but turn if you can. Matthew tells us in Matthew 9 and 18 that our Lord was in the midst, after he, the crowd received him, of a teaching. He was preaching a sermon. How many know that anything Jesus preached was necessary? Anything Jesus preached, you know, um, I don't care what you call good preaching. The folk who heard Jesus preach and heard Jesus teach heard the best. Because Jesus is the word. And with Jesus, the word was preaching and teaching the word. So when Jesus preached and taught the word, Jesus preached and talked about himself. He said, the whole volume of the books, and the volume of the book, it is written of me. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Then the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And the people in Matthew 9 heard the word. Teaching the word. The Bible says, as he spake these things, we learn from Mark, Luke, and from Mark and Luke that the Lord was interrupted by a man named Jairus. Mark tells us his name and Luke tells us his name. Matthew 9 and 18 says, and while he spake these things, behold, there came a certain ruler. We learn his name from Mark and Luke. His name was Jairus. Mark 5 and 22, Luke 8 and 41. Where Jairus means whom God enlightens. Follow me today. And uh, so Jairus interrupts our Lord's sermon. The Lord in his teaching didn't get a chance to call on Rocky and the church house band and to close out his sermon strong. He was interrupted by a certain man that the gospel says, tells us his name was Jairus. We also learn from Mark and from Luke that he was of the rulers of the synagogue. Mark tells us in verse chapter 5, verse 22, there come one of the rulers of the synagogue. Luke says he was a ruler of the synagogue, which meant that this man was not just a certain ruler, but he was a Pharisee. Follow me. The Pharisees were the enemies of Christ. And yet we find this Pharisee coming to Jesus. This Pharisee was a group of, uh, was this, this Jewish group of synagogue rulers were laymen who were responsible for the administrative part of the synagogue, not the priestly part. They were in charge of looking out for the building and supervising the worship. And so this man who was a Pharisee, a ruler uh, of the synagogue, he had authority and had reputation in the community. He came to Jesus and he interrupted our Lord's sermon. We learn from both Mark and Luke that the crowds were large. Also that they were glad to see him back on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And they were excited to see him. So he was preaching to an excited audience. A glad audience. 
who enjoyed the word that he was giving. Mark 5, 21 says, much people were gathered unto him. Luke 8 and 40 says, the people gladly received him, for they were waiting for him. Man, it's good to preach to a crowd who want to hear you. Amen. I preach to both hostile audiences and folk who uh, every time I, I couldn't get the words out of my mouth fast enough. And they'd say, amen, and give me more. I like that crowd better, but uh, you don't run into them often. So, it was a beautiful setting. Jesus is preaching to a people who wanted to hear him. Jesus is preaching to a people who were glad to see him. He had to feel good about it. The people at the, in the land of the Gadareans had just run him off. And he cast the devil out of the man. The folk was upset because the swines drowned. They said, leave our coast. He sails back. You know, one thing about Jesus, you tell him to leave. Guess what? He's a gentleman. He leaves. If you don't want Jesus today, he won't force himself on you. He won't want his healing, you won't get healed. You won't want his blessings, you won't get blessed. He's, he's a gentleman. But if you want him and you open up to him and you believe, he'll do what you ask him to do. He goes to this crowd. Place is packed out. People everywhere. Glad to see him. He's preaching to a house that's glad to see him. And in the midst of his sermon, he gets interrupted by this man. We learn from all three gospels that Jairus was a father. And that his daughter was gravely ill. Um. Uh, this takes nothing away from a father-son relationship. There's a difference between the love that a father has for his daughter than the love that a father has for his son. Neither love is greater than the other. Neither love is more than the other. But they are different. Dads love their sons with expectation. Expect for that son to walk in your shoes. Expect him to carry on the work and to, and to be like you. Fathers love their daughters unconditionally more of a protector of her you're not saying anything you show your son uh, by how you treat your mother how he is to treat a young lady you demonstrate by loving your daughter what to expect from a young man. This is why fathers is so important that you treat her special. You tell her that she's special. So she won't get hooked up with some mean, controlling, silly imbecile who will mistreat her. Praise the Lord. Beat on her. Talk down to her. I'm not getting much help. Amen. But you settle for the wrong kind of man. I figured John was all right. When Crystal came and said, Dad, I met a man, and he reminds me of you. I said, she's cooking with gas. That's what I wanted to hear. Say amen. You all are mysteriously quiet today. Every father ought to be in the father-daughter uh, banquet. And dad, it's not too late. Say, well, I didn't teach my daughter that. Start today. Hey, Amen. You, you may not be able to, you can't undo the past, but you can alter the future. You can do something about the present. Jarius was a father. 
Matthew 9 and 18, he says, My little daughter is even now dead. Wasn't just a father, but his daughter was gravely ill. Matthew, he tells Jesus, she says, good as dead. Mark 5 and 23, he says, my little daughter lieth at the point of death. Luke records in 8 and 42, he says, my only daughter, she lieth a dying. So she was his little girl. We don't know whether or not he had sons, but we do know that she was the own, his only daughter. And that she was in bad shape. So sick that Matthew says, he says she's dead. Mark says she's almost. Luke says, she lie or dying. When you combine the accounts, she was all but gone. Are you with me? Dr. Luke, only of the synoptics, he's the only one who tells us of her age. Luke says she was about 12 years of age. You know what that means? That's interesting in Luke 8, 42, about 12 years of age. That means that she was almost in biblical times. And this is going to be, it's going to stun some of you. Brother Bragg, she was almost considered a woman. The rabbis said that a little girl who was 12 years old and one day, was considered a woman and could, with parental permission, marry. Back in biblical times. Now, the rabbis also said that the minimum age for a boy, when a boy was considered a man, was when he was 13. And that a boy uh, should be married, considered a man at 13, between the ages of 18 at the youngest and 20 at the eldest, oldest, he should be married. Now we're saying, thank God, they don't require that today. And I understand that, that we don't see things that way. But that's, that's a two-sided coin. See, back then, in terms of, you won't like me, mental development, training, and teaching, the 12-year-old girl was as old as I, in her mental development, 25-year-old women. The 20-year-old Jewish male was as old as our 50-year-old men. In this day and time, we have men in their 40s, women in their 30s, still just getting up off the mat, slow in our development. Something that we could learn from this. Even today, when that Jewish boy turns 13 and they give him his bar mitzvah, from that day forward, he's spoken to dealt with and treated like a man. No wonder he matures much faster than his African-American male counterpart or his Italian counterpart. Then we criticize them because they can make money. But they develop faster. So, lest I make some of you too mad with me. Matter of fact, the boy was expected not only to be able to marry by the time he was 20, but he was expected by the time he was 20 to have a diary to give to the father 
of the young girl. So you, don't, you don't just come take the man's daughter, but you give her something. Give him something for her. Because the daughter contributed to the income of the family. Everybody worked. So if you're going to take the daughter, the, 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 the thinking back then, well, well, what do we get? Now he take the daughter and she pay. Mother, I told him I'm trying to preach, teach. <laughs> you didn't see that coming, did you? So, Luke tells us her age because here's what he's saying. She was just at the age where she was beginning to live. Right at the age when life is about to happen for her. Tragedy strikes. Tragedy strikes hits this little girl. The question is this. What would bring a proud Pharisee to his knees? Risk religious ridicule and persecution and public embarrassment. What would make a proud Pharisee who was of the enemies of Christ drop to his knees and beg Jesus for help? The answer a sick unto death, nearly dead daughter. Matthew 9 and 18 says that he came to Jesus and he, and this was public, interrupted his sermon and he worshipped him. Mark 5, 22 says he fell at Jesus' feet. Can you imagine the Pharisee dressed like a Pharisee? Recognized as a Pharisee who was supposed to be superior to Christ, this Pharisee walked up to Jesus without an appointment. He didn't do a Nicodemus. He didn't come by night because he didn't have that luxury. In his mind, had he waited till till the sun went down, his daughter would have been dead. So he shows up. He breaks all rules of decorum. He breaks all the rules and, and interrupts the message. Stops Jesus mid sentence. And fall at his feet. And says to Jesus. According to Luke 8 and 41. He fell at Jesus' feet. And besought him. That he would come to his house. The synoptics agree. That Jesus although. Giving no moral reply. The synoptics agree. That Jesus went. Luke tells us in Luke 8. He went. Mark says Jesus went with him. Matthew says Jesus arose and followed him. Thank you for watching God First. Experience this message in its entirety by calling toll-free 877-463-3477 to purchase your copy in CD or DVD format. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day.